price your products in a way that supports your business, not in a way that tries to you know, undercut the competition and wait for the funding to come in. Welcome to Honest E-Commerce, a podcast dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer, and I believe running a direct-to-consumer brand does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. On this podcast, we interview founders and experts who are putting in the work and creating real results. I also share my own insights from running our top Shopify consultancy, Electric Eye. We cut the fluff in favor of facts to help you grow your e-commerce business. Let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Honest E-Commerce. I feel like I haven't recorded one of these in a month. So this is going to be fun. Uh, Today, we're welcoming the show. uh, Truly awesome story here that we're about to get into. uh, The the founder of Bread Seriously, Sadie Sheffer. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm so good. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, we're going to have a blast and I'm going to fake it till I make it. I'll, I'll, I feel like uh, I've done this so many times that I just got to get back in the groove and then I'll, I'll remember what I'm doing. So bear with me on, on the being a host side of things. You got it. Awesome. So uh, you've got a, a pretty interesting story about a kind of the inception of the brand. Uh, and, and it has to kind of do with MIT. So uh, the floor is yours. How did, uh, how did this kind of the, the journey began? Well, the journey was circuitous. I like to call myself an accidental baker. Um, so I went to MIT for undergrad, hated it, dropped out, um, and didn't know what to do next. So I decided to move to San Francisco because the person I had a crush on from school lived out here. Um, and so I just thought that was like my next journey. So I showed up. It wasn't mutual, (laughs) um, which was really devastating. And um, I didn't have any other plans. So I decided that if I made myself a little more interesting, maybe he'd be interested in me. Um, And I knew that he was gluten intolerant. So I decided to learn how to cook and bake things that were gluten free. And that started a very quick obsession with cooking and baking. It's still like my ultimate hobby. Um, Learned all the ins and outs of gluten-free ingredients. Got really excited about bread, about fermentation, and bread seriously went from there. So how long after um, learning to bake to impress a boy or a girl, uh, did it go into uh, being a a career, I guess, until being a startup, until launching a, an actual brand. It was two years from moving to San Francisco to launching Bread Seriously, and about nine months after launch to going full time. And then, how? Like, I guess when you when you when when you, when you were hit with this passion, um, did you see a hole in the market? Like, what made you think that? Like, wait, maybe there's a business idea here. Not at all, actually. I um, I've always been a hobby business person. Um, my my whole family are business owners. Um, like everybody's been self employed. I didn't even like. I remember going to at MIT. Someone invited me to a career fair, and I was like, "Why would Why would I go there? Like, I'm going to be self employed." It never even occurred to me to work for someone else, um, which is weird (laughs) in hindsight. Um, so this is actually my fourth hobby business. I've made t-shirts and bike clothing and accessories and sold those before. And this was just another hobby business. So at the beginning, my goal was literally, I will sell bread to friends and family and in exchange, they will give me money and I can use that money to buy ingredients so that I can keep refining the recipe for myself, like for personal use, because it was really expensive and I didn't, have a lot of money. Um, so it was at the point of like selling to strangers and having word of mouth spreading that I was like, okay, this is different than the other businesses I've run. I think that, uh, entrepreneurship is definitely like, once you get bit by it, it's, it, there's no going away. I remember myself being like, I'm never going to have a real job. Uh, I think like almost 10 years ago, maybe I interviewed at an agency uh, they were one of the cooler ones in Columbus, where I'm from, uh, and I didn't get the job. And I got some inside scoop through uh, someone that I knew that knew someone higher up there. And they're like, "Yeah, that guy was gonna quit like six months later and start his own business." And I was like, "Well, I guess I'll just do it now." Uh, so that's what I did. I love that. So let's talk about starting like a consumer packaged good brand, starting a bread brand. I feel like there's just some hurdles that come inherently with 
you know, at anything you can eat. Uh, there's the FDA. There's all sorts of crazy stuff. So what what were some of the things that you had to uh, learn on the way? Oh my goodness, there's so many. I would say at the beginning, <laughs> like my first big aha moment was in the beginning, I wanted to bake everything myself and hire someone to run the business. And so the first big change was flipping that and realizing I never wanted to bake anything again for for sale, but I was really excited about the numbers and the business structure and things like that. So that was like, that was one year in 2012, um, which was a very fortunate transition for me. Um, that's when I started hiring a team um, first it was hiring production team members and then it was hiring, um, marketing and then operations and then sales, um, then HR. So that was a good one. I would say like my least favorite stuff is the admin. So all of the food safety paperwork, like food safety is cool. I like that stuff, but the paperwork is, you know, very dry and boring. Um, but it's like a little blip in all of the things we do in a year. It, it accounts for like, you know, a fraction of a percent of the work. It's not that bad. It's not that scary. If you know your food safety and you know that you're putting out safe product um, and that stuff's like fun and technical and interesting. So it's not for anyone who's like intimidated by that stuff. Just like it's relatively small scope. Yeah. I just, I think it's really important. What you said there is like you, quickly realized that you had to flip the script on, you know, uh, turning it from maybe like a, a hobby that pays into an actual business is you have to get out of the business. You can't, you can't really do it anymore. And, you know, hiring trustworthy people to kind of run the business for you is the only way to actually build a true business. I know a lot of people that build jobs for themselves, if that makes sense. But until you actually replace yourself in the process, until you can like go on vacation for a week and things don't implode, like you don't really have a business, you just have a job. Um, so that's that's something I really want to highlight is during that kind of you know startup phase, like having to get that mindset shift of delegation and and getting stuff off your plate because the the tasks that are going to make it a successful business cannot like be second to producing product ever. So it's something that's really worth like highlighting there. Yeah. And it's an ongoing journey. You know, our business just turned 10 last week and I'm still definitely working in the business. Um, I'm acting operations manager right now and have been for the last year. Um, so that's probably the next big hiring hurdle for me is like stepping back out of it. You know, I've been in it, I've been out of it, I'm back in it. Um, it's, it's, I assume it will be a forever, you know, tug of war. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's, there are certain things that I think that some founders are like, you know, like, I know I shouldn't do this, but I really like it and I'm going to keep doing it. Is there anything that is kind of still on your radar that you're like, I don't know if I'll ever let this go? Um, my personal passion is leadership. Um, and so, while I, while I have an amazing HR manager who's also very skilled and passionate about leadership, I feel like I'm still holding the reins there in terms of like company culture and leadership training for people. Um, so that one, I feel like it's going to be heartbreaking to let it go, but probably definitely the best thing. <laughs> awesome. So I think with uh, another thing with consumer packaged goods and just getting into that entire space is there's this a whole like D to C for consumables and for, you know, the stuff that you'd find on shelves at the grocery stores, like the probably the most youngest part of direct consumers now that just like economies of scale and shipping makes a lot more sense. So when you guys first launched the business, was it, uh, was it a wholesale play at first or was it always direct to consumer? Uh, how did, how did it kind of play out? It started as a direct to consumer bike delivery business, um, which is actually how word of mouth spread so fast. We got a bunch of press <clears throat> like seven or eight months in because I was delivering everything on my bicycle, um, which was because I didn't have a driver's license. Um, <laughs> so that was a, that was a wild ride. I was riding like a hundred miles a week delivering bread. Um, then let's see my vision or like my business plan in the beginning was to go farmer's markets. I was going to do like nine farmer's markets a week on my cargo bike, you know, just like everything, everything, bicycle, everything direct, everything local. Um, 
got into my first farmer's market and just, I absolutely hated it. We weren't making any money. It was miserable. It was hard. Um, and simultaneously I had started selling bread wholesale at one of my favorite grocery stores, Buy Right Market in San Francisco, just as like an ego thing. I was like, I just really want to see my product on the shelves there. So even though I don't think we have the margins to do wholesale, I'm just going to do this one like as a treat to myself. Um, and then I realized that we were selling as much bread at buy right as we were at the farmer's market with so much less labor. Um, and so that flipped the switch there. Like, OK, we're going wholesale and figured out the margins, scaled the wholesale business first locally in the Bay Area, then California, then West Coast. Um, and then in, I think, 2014, so like three years in, actually built like a website that could handle e-commerce um, to start shipping nationwide. And we started shipping, you know, 30 boxes a week and then 90 boxes a week. And now we're up to, you know, hundreds of boxes a week. And that was the that was the scale. So since COVID, we're about 50-50 wholesale and e-commerce. Absolutely. Now, with uh, building out kind of those wholesale relationships. Uh, I feel like that's something that we we don't touch on much here. So do you have any insights on to like, how do I get my, uh, you know, I, I, my new cookie brand, Chase's Cookies, how do I get them into on the shelves? What like, what's that look like? How do I do I just walk in and talk to people? Great question. Um, so I feel like I handed off sales many years ago. So I'm a little rusty. Um, I can I direct people to a, a resource? I would I would love to. Yeah, what do we got? Okay, Ali Ball is my my wholesale hero. Um, I think it's AliBall.com or AllisonBall.com. She runs a program called Retail Ready that is specifically for new food CPG brands trying to get onto retail shelves. She was my buyer at Buy Right, um, and she's been doing this for maybe six or seven years. She's amazing. I put all of my sales and marketing team through her Retail Ready program t- because she's better at training them than I am. Um, so I would definitely send people to Allie. Um, I liked what you said. You said wholesale relationships. Relationships are so key. So we have a full-time account manager who is like his, his like superpower is relationship building. Um, and so he knows all of our buyers and they know him and he takes care of them and it's building these like relationships of reciprocity. Um, you know, we're not just trying to like sell, sell, sell. We're trying to figure out like, what do our, what do our accounts need and how can we nurture them and strengthen them, um, and create like really long-term relationships. Um, so even when there's turnover with our buyers, even when the stores are having a tough time, like they think of us first. Um, so I think that's really key. Absolutely. I think that, uh, that's just like the, sales training in me <laughs> knowing that it, it's always a relationship it's but it starts with a relationship before it becomes any sort of transactional thing uh and if you view it a different way uh you're going to come off unsincere and you're probably going to go out of business i don't know yeah it's nice to like feel like you are actually cultivating a community around the business as well um that is a type of resilience that I think is really important, especially as, you know, the world is on fire, like having these local resilient relationships and people we can lean on and people we can help. It's just a really wholesome feeling. Yeah. And you said this whole thing about reciprocity earlier, and that's like a really, I, I, I've found that I, it, it works very well. It just to, 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 to make it kind of straightforward, like uh, you, you're going to meet people throughout your career be it in, you know, starting a brand or working at an agency or being some sort of consultant or whatnot, that like you probably can't really help each other then, but they might move on to something or, you know, down the line, like they maybe have a lead that's perfect for you or an introduction that's gonna change your business, you know, some new wholesaler that might need to be connected with your product. Um, and just it, living in a way that is like, you know, building those relationships, trying to stay in touch, just trying to be as helpful as you can, you know, to an extent, like obviously you can't give away everything for free, but just being honest and available and open to people opens so many more doors. It does. Yeah. And it, it feels good to be able to help people. Um, and it definitely feels like thinking about relationships as like, how can I put into this relationship? Not what can I get out of it is like the key for us. Yeah. That's definitely a mindset shift that people need to kind of consider. If you're struggling with scaling your sales, maybe Electric Eye can help. Our team has helped our clients generate millions of dollars in additional revenue through our unique brand scaling framework. 
You can learn more about our agency at electriceye.io. That's E L E C T R I C E Y E.io. Mesa is the Shopify expansion pack to level up your brand. By turning all your internet connected apps into your business epicenter, Mesa can lighten your workload and tame the day to day chaos of running your store. Join the other successful brands that have learned how to balance clever workflows with a solid infrastructure to get more done without additional overhead. Whether you need to order data in Google Sheets, add products on Etsy, or get customers added to HubSpot, Mesa has you covered. Peace of mind is right around the corner when all your apps are working seamlessly together. To put it quite simply, Mesa is a better way to work. Search Mesa, that's M-E-S-A, in the Shopify App Store and download it today. Our partner Rewind can protect your Shopify store with automated backups of your most important data. Rewind should be the first app you install to protect your store against human error, misbehaving apps, or collaborators gone bad. It's like having your very own magic undo button. Trusted by over 100,000 businesses, from side hustles to the biggest online retailers like NYX, Gatorade, and Movement Watches. Best of all, Respond to any of their welcome emails and mention this podcast, Honest E-Commerce, to get your first month absolutely free. Is your store holiday ready? Now is the time to make sure you and your team are prepared for the busy season ahead. Gorgeous, an omni-channel help desk built or e-commerce has machine learning functionality that takes the pressure off small support teams and gives them the tools to manage a large number of inquiries at scale, especially during the holiday season. Gorgeous combines all your different communication channels like email, SMS, social media, live chat, and even phone into one platform and gives you an organized view of all your customer inquiries. Their powerful functionality can save your support team hours per day and makes managing customer orders a breeze. Merchants can close tickets faster than ever with the help of pre-written responses integrated with customer data to increase the overall efficiency of customer support. Their built-in automations also free up time for support agents to give better answers to complex product-related questions, providing next-level support which helps increase sales, brand loyalty, and recognition. Eric Bandholtz, the founder of Beard Brand, says, we're a seven-figure business, and we have essentially one person on customer support and experience. It's impossible to do that without tools like Gorgeous to help us innovate. Learn how to level up your customer support by speaking with their team. Visit gorgeous.grsm.io slash honest and mention this podcast when you sign up for two months free. That's G-O-R-G-I-A-S dot G-R-S-M dot I-O slash honest. Getting an online business off the ground isn't easy. So if you find yourself working late, tackling a to-do list that's a mile long with your fifth cup of coffee by your side, remember, great email doesn't have to be complicated. That's what Klaviyo is for. It's the email and SMS platform built to help e-commerce brands earn more money by creating genuine customer relationships. Once you set up a free Klaviyo account, you can start sending beautiful branded messages in minutes, thanks to drag and drop design templates and built in guidance. And with e-commerce specific recommendations and insights, you can keep growing your business as you go. Get started with a free account at klaviyo.com slash honest. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash honest. Not to completely go 160 on the conversation, but I do want to kind of talk a little bit more about direct consumer. Um, So you said you launched the site, was it back in 2014, I think you said? I think so. All right. And so... Obviously, that's just the wild west. <laughs> like, how did you, how did you kind of like find that initial traction? Where were you going to try to try to get customers? Like, what did the the playbook look like back then, and and how did it evolve? Good question. So, I feel like unlike a lot of CPG founders, my my thing is operations, not marketing and sales. I feel like most of my peers are like really good at the marketing and sales side. Um, so, marketing was the first thing I hired for. I was like, I'm not good at this. It's not fun for me. I'm going to bring someone in who can do this. And so my first marketing director, her job was, um, you know, fine tuning the website, doing SEO and working on getting our e-commerce sales up. Um, so it was sort of like 
e-commerce was under the marketing umbrella actually until this year. Um, now it's under sales. Sales was specifically wholesale for us. So it was a little bit unconventional there. So I think we started with just fine tuning our email marketing. That was um, the first person I hired. That was her skill set was email marketing. We have like, I think customer loyalty and customer relationships are our superpower as a business. Our customer care is outstanding. Um, like anyone who's tried our product and had an issue with it, like call customer care, you will be taken care of. Um, we try it, we aim to, to like create delight. That's customer cares thing. Um, and so that customer loyalty is what I think created the original e-commerce traction, um, especially customers who were like getting their bread by bike delivery and then moved out of the area and then shared it by word of mouth. Now, um, let's see, we, I mean, we've done a lot of work on like our customer flywheel and customer retention, um, just looking at the customer journey throughout like from first finding out about our brand through placing their first order or through placing their 10th order. Um, and then customer acquisition wise, it's been a little bit slow since COVID because we used to do a lot of in-person events, farmers markets, craft shows, food markets. And so that's mostly dried up. We do a few virtual events since COVID. Um, we're, we're very conservative about COVID safety. So right at the beginning, we said like, pull out of the farmer's market, pull out of anything in person. Um, cause our goal is that nobody gets COVID because of their job at bread seriously. So yeah, looking forward to someday being able to do those again, but I don't think it was as big a loss as we expected it to be, um, with everybody shifting their purchasing habits to online, um, we sort of like bulked up our you know, our ad strategy and things like that to still keep, you know, a, a pipeline of customers coming in. Absolutely. I got, I got a few questions out of that, that response. So the first one being, uh, your advocates for your customer, customer cares team is obviously to create delight. How often are you, you know, trying to jump on the phone with customers, not even ones that are complaining, but like interviewing your customers just to find out more information? Not too often. We just did a big survey. Um, but that was, you know, virtual or just a, like a Google form. So I think, um, we have a, Nicole is our community manager right now. And I think her, um, one of the things she's interested in and the ideas she brought to the table is to become more of like a VIP account manager for our top hundred customers or something. Um, so I'm excited that that is coming. Uh, but I would say right now, it's more like when someone calls in to complain, our customer care team is really good at keeping them on the phone and learning more. Um, but we're not reaching out to customers for those calls. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we just did a round of uh, customer interviews right before I went on vacation. And uh, just the stuff that we learned was amazing. And it's changing like a lot of the copy that we... How we talk about ourselves, how we present ourselves. You were talking about your kind of the customer flywheel. Uh, we've, we've been doing a lot of work lately on like our customer avatar, you know, who it, those VIP customers, the same type of thing. And it's just like, honestly, the answers are in whomever's already purchasing from you. So just go ask them what you should do better. And it's it, it kind of just keeps building upon itself. Definitely. So one thing that I think is unique about uh, consumables in general is like, you know, the store quantities are a lot smaller than online and you have to like make decisions on like kind of like what your margins look like with shipping and all that at Jazz. So do you have any, and you can get as detailed or, or not here, but like any tips for brands uh, that are thinking about how to kind of start offering something that's you got a lower price point, like a consumable online, like how to package that up. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, get really clear on your costs, um, especially shipping. Shipping is like always changing. <laughs> I think we made a bunch of decisions. Here's like a mistake I can share is that we've made pricing decisions based on the prices we got from our shipping carriers who had no obligation to keep those prices. So when those changed, we suddenly either had to change our prices or eat that margin. Um, so that's something we're dealing with right now. Um, so just be mindful about like what's realistic with your shipping, get really clear on what shipping actually costs um, and check your shipping invoices. That was the big mistake of 2020 um, is that we thought we were getting charged what we agreed to, but, Turned out we used the inner dimensions of our box, not the outer dimensions, which ended us cost ended up costing us, I think, 27 grand for the year. 
um, because we weren't checking those invoices um, to notice all the overcharges we were getting, which were our fault. Um, but we didn't realize till way too late. So <laughs> that's tip number one. Um, we, a lot of people want to buy a single loaf for, uh, from us, um, which would end up costing, you know, $20. Um, and so we bundle everything into three packs so that the shipping cost sort of neatly folds into the cost of the bread and averages out in a way that's not like totally outrageous. It's still an expensive product and it's expensive shipping. We have to ship it in two days or less because it's perishable. So doing those bundles and doing those bundles in a way that makes sense with the shipping rates that we can get um, is sort of a fun little puzzle that I, I recommend like getting creative about how you batch things. Absolutely. Yeah, that was uh, kind of what I assumed you were going to say because I've done this interview now a dozen times, but it, it's, I always learn more. Um, and I really enjoyed you sharing kind of a resource with uh, Allison Ball, I believe was her name. Um, is there any anything else that comes to mind that uh, is like this is a, a great resource for people to kind of check out and to learn more? Yeah, for for costing specifically, Ali Ball has a a Cogs for e-commerce class. So Cogs is cost of goods sold. It's working out exactly how to price things to make sure that you're making money on every sale rather than losing money on every sale. I think it's really important, even if you don't like math and don't like numbers, learn the concepts of gross margin, Cogs, break even, and those will take you a significant way um, toward pricing in a way that that makes you profitable. Um, and I highly recommend like there's, I think the the unicorn theory of like brand, like explosive brand growth of like, I will sell this at a loss until big money comes in and we can scale it. Like try not to do that. Make money, <laughs> like stay profitable. It's really great. Um, there is, I think there are unicorns out there that does work for some people. I don't think it works for most people. Um, and so if you want to stay in business longer, like price your products in a way that supports your business, not in a way that tries to, you know, undercut the competition and wait for the funding to come in. Cause that is, a, that is a reach. Um, Let's see, the other resource, um, there's a woman named Sarah Delavan, who I'm about to start working with, but her specialty is food cogs as well. Um, so she could be a great resource. Awesome. That's amazing. I'll make sure to link to all that in the show notes. And I'm going to drop Allison an email and see if she wants to be on the show soon. So maybe that will come soon. Um, is, is there anything I forgot to ask you about that you, you think is relevant that you want to share with the audience before we go today? I, I mentioned that my passion is leadership. Um, I, I recommend in the in the like theme of customer relationships and um, kind of brand loyalty and brand longevity and reciprocity. Like I highly recommend coming up with some brand values for everyone um, because those I think a lot of people think of that as sort of a marketing shtick. Uh, we use it as a decision making tool. Um, so once we could get really clear on our values, so we, we've done this exercise a few times. The first time we came up with 15 values, which I think is very common, you know, trust, safety, uh, communication, respect, you know, all of these things. And the, the key learning that we had was that if you can't remember your values, you can't practice them. Uh, so we narrowed it down to three. Our values are to serve, nourish, and include. Um, and we can use those as decision-making tools when something hard comes along. You know, when COVID comes along, we can say, what are we doing to serve, nourish, and include our customers, our buyers, our employees? Um, so I think that's a really great tool that um, is worth talking about. Oh, no. I, I mean, I couldn't agree anymore. I, I, I remember when we first did ours, I think we had like seven or eight. And we're like, well, this is just way too many. And then it, the more that you iterate upon it, it just gets so much better. And then you go, you know what? Like this one actually falls under this one. We're just saying the same thing twice. Like, why are we doing that? Um, and, you know, I think actually just the iteration on running those exercises, things just get more clear. Uh, and it just makes more sense and everything just gets better. Uh, and not only just like uh, the, the the values exercise, but I think like the customer avatar exercise or, you know, honestly, like 
go look at your SOPs that you haven't touched in two or three years. And I guarantee you're like, well, this could be way better. Like we should be doing this instead. Definitely. And at some point it's good to just leave them as they are and work on bigger and better stuff too. Cause that's, a, that's also a trap. You know, we, we like to go oh, back yeah, and say, yeah. what can we be doing better instead of like trying the new stuff that might be a little more scary. That's a, that's, a, that's why my partner is uh, involved. Cause I'm definitely a tinkerer. I, you know, I'm like, how do we optimize this thing? And it's like, it doesn't need optimized. And just the things I've automated that don't need automated. Oh man, I could write a book about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one verb, my favorite verb that I picked up from someone a long time ago is good enoughing it. Is this good enough or does it have to be perfect? No, let's just good enough it and move on. So I gift that word to you. That was, yes. Good. I, 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 I like down, especially when you're talking about uh, delegation as well. I think that especially when you're first getting into delegation, you're trying to like create like a clone of yourself. And that's just, it's got, it, is it good enough? Move on. Like you're the only one that cares that much, probably. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one because I think it can also be kind of like, um, what's the word like patronizing to your staff if you're saying like what you did is good enough um change your definition of what is good enough like if it's good enough for your standards that doesn't actually mean that your standards are the best like your employee standards could be way better and way different than yours so open up that definition of like what what great looks like because mm-hmm. that's sort of like the way out of that delegation trap or that micromanagement trap, um, like try to delegate in a way that lets your staff shine and succeed and win. Um, not in the way that like makes you look the best. I think what I try to do myself is delegate outcomes and I don't really care how it happens. It's just like, this is what I want. Hopefully can you help me do that? I like that. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, you know, nobody, especially on smaller teams or when you kind of get more uh, mature in your career, nobody wants to like run through a checklist. They like, they like a challenge. They like to use their smarts and they like to solve, be creative. I think problem solving and creativity is in human nature and people just like to tackle that stuff. And so not having like a predetermined or predescribed, like this is how you're supposed to do it. It's just like, you know, like this is what we're looking for. And this is why I think the why is very important too. And this is why we're looking for that. And then it's like, just help us get there. Have fun. Let us know what you're doing. I, I love that clarity. Totally. Awesome. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation. If someone's interested in the product, where should they go to check it out and maybe pick up a few loaves? Yeah. Come to breadseriously.com. You can get three packs of all our products shipped nationwide. Or if you're on the West Coast, check us out in natural grocery stores. We'll be in the refrigerator section, which trips some people up. It's a perishable product. So look for it in the fridge um, and enjoy it toasted. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. I can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey with us. We've got a lot to think about and potentially add into our own business. You can find all the links in the show notes. Make sure you head over to honestecommerce.co to check out all of the other amazing content that we have. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review. And obviously, if you're thinking about growing your business, check out our agency at electriceye.io. Until next time.